Oh Lord, may the words that I speak and the thoughts that our hearts think be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the movie The Matrix, machines have taken over the world and use people like batteries. The people seemingly live in a normal world, but it's only a computer-generated illusion called The Matrix. In reality, people exist in a state of sleep. They are slaves hooked up to a machine that harvests their bioenergy. The main character in the movie, Neo, is awakened from this sleep existence by men who are fighting against their machine rulers. He is called out of slavery to the Matrix so that he might save the real world. But in order to do that, he and his companions must voluntarily go back into the Matrix only by doing that can they defeat it. The na Matrix naturally tries to kill Neo. It even appears to have succeeded. But in a remarkable scene, Neo is resurrected and wins the battle over the Matrix. The Matrix, of course, is only a movie. It contains, however, an echo of the gospel that is proclaimed in God's Word. The Word of God gives us the real truth. Jesus voluntarily came into this world of slavery in order that he might save us. The world, of course, wants to kill him. We see its first attempt to do so in today's Holy Gospel, where King Herod wants to destroy the newborn king of the Jews. In order to protect his son from Herod's evil plot, the Heavenly Father sends Jesus into Egypt, a land that meant slavery to the Israelites. God then calls Jesus out of Egypt in order to save the entire world from its slavery to sin and death. Out of Egypt I called my son. These words from Hosea 11 verse 1 originally described the children of Israel, God's Old Testament son, whom God delivered from bondage in Egypt by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. From today's Holy Gospel, however, we learn that these words also apply to Jesus and to us. When the Israelites first went into Egypt 1,800 years before the time of Christ, they did not go as slaves. They went as guests of Joseph, one of the twelve sons of Jacob, the children of Israel. God had given to Joseph the ability to inter interpret the Egyptian ruler's dreams which warned of a coming famine. And so Egypt, under the direction of Joseph, was able to prepare for this time of famine. Joseph brought his own family, his father Jacob, and all of his brothers and their families to Egypt so that they too might ex escape the ravages of famine. And for many years, the children of Israel prospered in Egypt. But then there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He was afraid that the Israelites, who were becoming very numerous, might turn against the Egyptians and try to become their masters. To protect against this, the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They lived as slaves in Egypt for over a hundred years until God sent Moses to rescue his people from bondage in that great act of deliverance that we now know as the Exodus. In today's Holy Gospel, we see God sending his son Jesus into Egypt. Jesus goes there with Mary and Joseph to escape the evil attempts of King Herod to kill him. So just as the Israelites first went to Egypt to escape from possible death by famine, Jesus goes to Egypt to escape death at the hands of Herod. But just as Egypt came to represent slavery in the minds of the Israelites, so Egypt ultimately comes to represent slavery to Jesus. For Egypt is not just a geographical location to which the Christ child journeyed. Egypt represents the sinful world into which Jesus was born. 
the same sinful world into which you and I have been born. It's what St. Paul is talking about in today's epistle when he writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus was born under the law, subject to all of its requirements and restraints. He was born into our sinful, sin-filled world so that he might keep the law perfectly for us and so that he then might also suffer the full consequences of our failure to keep God's law. Out of Egypt I called my son. As he often does, St. Matthew cites an Old Testament passage, this one from Hosea 11, verse 1, and applies it to Jesus. He does so to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's Old Testament promises. Just as God led his Old Testament people out of Egypt so that he might save them, so God now leads his only son, Jesus, out of Egypt so that he might save all people through him. But here we see a bit of a twist, don't we? For the Israelites, Egypt had become a bad place, a place of slavery. In escaping from Egypt, the Israelites were leaving a place of death and going to a promised land where, would they, where they would know peace and freedom. When Jesus leaves the land of Egypt, he's leaving behind a place of relative security to return to a land where his life will continually be at risk. If there's any doubt about that, Matthew tells us that even though Herod the Great has died and is no longer a threat to the Christ child, Herod's son Archelaus now sits on the throne of Judea, and he is as great a threat to Jesus as Herod was. Once again, God, for a time, protects the life of his son. At God's direction, Joseph bypasses Bethlehem, where he had perhaps for a while been thinking about settling with Mary and Jesus, and instead he decides to return to Nazareth, where he and Mary had lived before the decree of Caesar Augustus had forced them to travel to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem for the census. In doing so, Joseph fulfills another Old Testament prophecy, this one from Isaiah 11, verse 1. For he who is the shoot that will come forth from the stump of Jesse will grow up in Nazareth, a name which means shoot town. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Because of Jesus, these words also now apply to you and to me. When God created our first parents, Adam and Eve, he put them in the beautiful garden called Eden, and they were completely free. They had complete freedom to do everything that God willed for them and to fully enjoy all of God's richest blessings. The devil, however, led them to think of this perfect existence as slavery since it did not include, include being gods themselves. Do what I tell you, the devil urged them, and you will be like God. Adam and Eve listened to the devil. They disobeyed the will of God, and in doing so they enslaved, they exchanged the freedom they had enjoyed under God for a life of slavery to sin and death. Just as the children of Israel had entered Egypt as free men and women only to lose that freedom, so Adam and Eve had been created free but had lost that freedom when they rebelled against God and chose their will instead of His. You and I as sons of Adam and daughters of Eve now reap the consequences of that sin, of that rebellion. Our Egypt is the fallen world into which we have been born. It is also the sinful condition, the sinful nature that we have inherited from our parents going all the way back to Adam and Eve. We see the signs of our Egypt wherever we turn. We see it in the evil and injustice in our world, in war and terror, in hunger and famine and poverty and sickness and death. We see it in our lives, in our own selves. We see it every time we do something we know we shouldn't do or fail to do something we know we should. We see it every time we hurt one another, or are hurt, even by those we love. We see it in our broken promises. We see it in our broken relationships. 
The end result of all of this is not only physical death, it is spiritual death, it is eternal death, cut off from God in his love for all eternity. But God has called us out of this Egypt. He has called us out of slavery to sin and death. Not because of anything that we have done or might do. No, it is because his son Jesus was willing to enter into our Egypt. Because he was willing to take upon himself not only our flesh and blood, but also our sin and guilt and our punishment. Because he was willing to take upon himself He was willing to take upon himself and suffer our death. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Jesus willingly became a slave to sin so that we might be saved. In our baptism, Jesus reminds us in Romans 6, uh, as Paul reminds us in Romans 6, we are baptized into his death and his resurrection. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In our baptism, God has called us out of the Egypt that is slavery to sin and all of its eternal consequences. He has called us to live the new life of the children of God, a new life that is lived not under the law and its threats, but under grace and its redeeming power. Joseph took a little child into Egypt to protect him from Herod. This child is the same Jesus who would free the world from its sin. God calls his son out of Egypt so that he can lead the world out of the greater Egypt that is slavery to sin. The Israelites saw Egypt as a place of bondage and death. God called them out of that land into the promised land, a land the Bible describes as flowing with milk and honey. Our Heavenly Father has called us out of Egypt. Our Lord Jesus has paid the price for our sin. He has set us free. Sin may try to drag us back into bondage, but that's why we're here again today, to hear again the good news of our deliverance, that Jesus has set us free to live in true freedom under the gospel, and to be reminded once more that one day our gracious God will call us once and for all from this Egypt of sin and death, to live with him in the promised land of heaven. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We rise to sing the offertory hymn, Create in Me.